Welcome back. Madam Secretary, Mr. Uh, Deputy Secretary, friends, good to see everybody. Um, as uh, on behalf of the Civil Rights uh, Committee of the Federalist Society, I'm delighted to see um, all of you. Um, welcome to the ranks of the unconfirmable. Um, it's good to see you here. <laughs> I'm thrilled also uh, to see uh, my friends who are uh, putting together the uh, Defense of Freedom Institute. I loved you guys when you were just DFI. Now that I know from Jim Blue that you're DeFi, I think that's even more badass, and I'm thrilled to be with you as well. We're here to talk about Title IX now. Uh, we have a smaller panel that we, than we had initially um, hoped for, in part because of uh, speaker uh, illness. I think we have now perhaps a little bit more representation from what you might call uh, the right side of the issue, maybe a little bit less from the wrong side of the issue. Um, I'll try to mix that all up, but to the extent that you want to ask any questions or make any comments that are wrong, uh, you will be welcome to do that during Q&A as well. Um, I am the founder and chairman of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law. I'm also the former Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights and had the uh, honor of serving under Secretary DeVos uh, during the Trump administration, having previously held the same position uh, during the George W. Bush administration. Um, having the opportunity to uh, speak with uh, Roger uh, Severino and Justin Dillon uh, and all of you, uh, reminds me a little bit about how this issue has changed uh, over time, and I wanted to say a, a few words of that. I think that primarily uh, our panel today will talk about two of the issues that are front and center with Title IX debates, which is to say sexual harassment and due process, but also LGBTQ issues under Title IX. When I first started dealing with Title IX policy uh, some 20 years ago, um, I found that uh, friends and family all knew what Title IX was, even if they'd never heard of some of the other statutes that I administered, such as Title VI or Section 504. And the reason is that Title VI race issues and were often on the front page of the mainstream newspapers. Uh, but then, as now, uh, nobody read the front pages of the mainstream newspapers. They knew about Title IX because that was on the sports pages. Everybody read that. Uh, back 20 years ago, uh, Title IX and the popular imagination dealt only with athletics because the big issue then uh, was sports. Uh, and the debate was over the extent to which OCR and other agencies should be permitted to more or less destroy certain non-revenue producing boys and men sports teams uh, in the name of enforcing protections for equal opportunity in athletics. That's something we don't really talk about nowadays. Why? In part because one side largely won and the other side largely lost. That is to say, the rules were set largely on the left and the conservatives probably didn't fight as much or as hard back then on that issue. And I think one of the questions now that we have is what's gonna happen when we look back at this 20 years from now? Are we gonna say once again that the battle was lost? Are we in the process of losing the battle? We now have seen the Biden regulations come out in draft, but that's just the beginning of the next battle. And how it goes, we'll yet to see. Now today we have the two sides of the current debate. Again, not all of the issues, not the athletics piece, but two very important pieces. Uh, one of them uh, deals with sexual assault and sexual harassment on the one hand and, and due process on the other. Now, what I want to say about that is that there is a great deal of consensus uh, around that issue, which is to say it is uncontroversial, I believe, that we as a society should be fighting sexual harassment and sexual assault on college campuses, in the high schools, and elsewhere. I think there's general agreement on that. And I'm proud to say that under President Trump and Secretary DeVos, uh, we conducted at the Office for Civil Rights some of the most ambitious investigations of uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment cases that the U.S. Department of Education had ever conducted, cases at places like Michigan State, Penn State, University of Southern California, and unquestionably the most ambitious systemic investigation of an urban public school system that had ever been conducted, finding massive problems within the Chicago public school systems. So there isn't a question really about whether we should be addressing sexual harassment and sexual assault in a serious way. 
but rather whether we should have certain kinds of due process protections while we do so. I'm glad that we will be touching on that issue today. At the same time, there's the question of the extent to which uh, federal regulations under the U.S. Department of Education should address LGBTQ issues and how they should do so in light of the fact that these words do not appear within the text of, of, of Title IX. For this, we have fortunately two outstanding speakers who I'm quite proud to share a table with. Uh, Justin Dillon is a partner in the law firm of Kaiser Dillon. I asked him if there's any relation to the Dillon of Kaiser Dillon, I'm told there isn't. You know, when I founded the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, uh, people started addressing me as uh, Mr. Brandeis. <laughs> And I would tell them, please, just call me Louie. <laughs> so at Kaiser Dillon, I don't know if we can just call you Kaiser? Right, that's okay. my title. Uh, yeah. um, he uh, is nationally uh, prominent for his work on Title IX. He has handled, what, over 100 cases involving Title IX issues and lost how many? Zero. Zero. Uh, lawsuits. I've lost on campus sometimes. Lost zero lawsuits, excellent, is also a writer um, on Title IX hearings and litigation, a practitioner's guide, uh, as well as uh, widely uh, published in uh, uh, an array of newspapers from the New York Times to the Washington Post to the Los Angeles Times, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Roger Severino uh, is Vice President of Domestic Policy and the Joseph C. and Elizabeth A. Anderlich Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. I've known him for years. Uh, he is also uh, a former head, um, long-serving director of the Office for Civil Rights at the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, he is an expert on uh, religious freedom uh, issues as well as on civil rights issues, which makes him, I think, uniquely qualified to address the issues that we will be hearing from him. So I'm thrilled. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will turn uh, first to Justin Dillon. Great. Um, well, thank you. Uh, uh, very much, Ken. It's an honor to be here. Um, thank you to the Defense for Freedom Institute and the Federalist Society. Um, and uh, I want to also thank Secretary DeVos um, and uh, also Candace Jackson, who was supposed to be here today, um, the former Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights, um, but who had a family emergency. Uh, you know, I work in the world where the rules we're going to talk about have an absolutely firsthand and direct impact upon the lives of people, on kids, on their families. So this isn't like legal theory. It might get a little bit, I'm going to try not to make it boring, um, but it might get a little legal, um, but it really does have a direct effect. And the n number of lives that have been changed for the better because of what Secretary Voss had the courage to do and, and what Candace Jackson had the courage to do, I, I can't overstate it. I mean, I remember we were in our law firm conference room and Secretary Voss gave her speech saying, look, we're going to look at some of these Title IX regs. And you just kind of felt like, wait, so I've, I haven't been taking crazy pills. This might actually happen. And her courage um, is tremendous, and, and, and Candace Jackson's as well. I also fully realize that this panel is the only thing that stands between one, you and hearing Secretary DeVos, and two, the happy hour. So we will try hard to keep it fun. Um, so um, I'll set. The, Ken's asked me to sort of set the table a little bit, and then we can go into later on, kind of talk about some of the proposed changes and how bad they are. Um, so you know, why, why are we here? Um, uh, you know, this panel is about uh, the Biden administration's attempt to gut um, the changes um, that Secretary DeVos uh, made in the Title IX regulations, which became effective only uh, two years ago, because that is what we do in this country now, apparently, is just, you know, change the rules every time uh, an election happens. Um, why did we need that? We needed that because before that happened, schools were essentially sacrificing, you know, sort of respondents, mostly young men, on the altar of kind of victims' rights and, and uh, you know, it's kind of political progressivism. Um, there were terrible things that happened. There was, I'll give you two stories, two kind of horror stories that would now not happen um, under the current regulations, um, but, but would the Biden administration would take us back to that. Number one, notice. I had a case once at a D.C. area school where um, the kid got a notice in like March. It was actually it was right before Passover. Um, I think it, I was on my way, in fact, um, to a, like a Passover with friends. Um, and the notice said, you are accused of having sexually assaulted three women in the fall, last fall. Um, please provide your response by Tuesday. That's all it said. 
And so you know, I called the associate general counsel and I said, hey, so listen, I, I know you don't have to put too much detail into the current law, but you know, I think he has a right to know like, who we're talking about, you know, given that it was also six months ago. And I swear to God, this is what she said, and she was a former assistant United States attorney. She said, and I quote, he knows what he did. Um, uh, I swear to God, that is an exact quote. Um, and you know, that was, and then you know, ultimately through a lot of, through frankly bringing in fire, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, um, Stuart Taylor and just raising a lot of hell ourselves, we managed to get them to back off that. And eventually, you know, we kind of made our way forward with that case and, and won it. But that's an example of something that the current regulations, the DeVos regulations, would not let happen because the notice actually has to give you, shockingly, detail about who's accusing you and what they're accusing you of. I know, it sounds crazy. Um, so, um, uh, and, the, and, this, and the second thing is just the, the cross-examination. Um, you know, before, um, uh, bef you know, before the regulations and cross-examination was allowed, y what would happen all the time in these hearings is complainants would tell stories that were kind of all over the place, changed almost every time they told them, often contradicted sort of, you know, basic, you know, some text messages that they had sent to their friends kind of before and after. Um, but the panel, of course, would never ask hard questions. And there's an institutional reason for that, right? Any, whether it was a single investigator employed by the school or whether it was, you know, a panel, I had a panel once that was like a classics professor, a guy who worked in the cafeteria, you know, real, real professionals at determining guilt and, and innocence in sexual misconduct cases. Um, they don't want to ask hard questions. They don't want to press the complainant and say, you know, you're saying this now, but this is what you said, you know, two months ago. Um, you know, how do you explain that? Because what happens to those people institutionally if they do that? Well, then they become targets, right? Like, especially if you don't have tenure, and you're going after some poor complainant, um, you know, there's, you're, you're gonna get, you're, you might lose your job. And so there's no incentive to ask hard questions. Then came the DeVos regulations, and finally, finally, you know, advisors could question the, every witness, the complainant and, and every witness in the case. And importantly, it wasn't left up to just the poor kid to do it because, oh my gosh, like, can you imagine having a 19-year-old, like, boy try to cross-examine anyone? Like, it'd be, a, I mean, it'd be like watching a baby deer try to walk while in a deer trap. It'd be horrifying for everyone. Very uncomfortable. Um, but, but, you know, when, when advisors can do it, um, you know, you can really get at the truth. Um, and, and it's been, I, I have seen firsthand, I'm sure I'll talk about that in a little bit, the difference that it makes. I mean, I, I, won, I won two cases last fall. But there is no way I would have won if I didn't have cross um, because of the things that came uncovered under that. So, you know, so I think what we're here today to, to talk about on my end is, um, you know, to, to tell you what you already believe, which is that what the Biden administration is doing is very, very bad, and what Secretary DeVos did was very, very good. So with that, I'll turn it over to my law school classmate, Roger Severino. All right. Thank you, Justin. We did try to have ideological balance in this panel. <clears throat> we did, in fact, invite Jocelyn Samuels from EOC, who, when I was head of OCR, we had a great civil debate at the Williams Institute on gender identity and religious freedom. Um, she declined, this was not her area, but she did say, Talk to my friend Catherine Lehman. So I actually invited <laughs> Catherine Lehman to be on this panel. For some reason, she declined. <laughs> um, I want to start with a story. So I grew up in Rosemead, California, which is a few miles away from Arcadia School District. And I would practice in the Arcadia School District track because ours was a dirt track and theirs was a nice track. <laughs> and then when I ended up at DOJ Civil Rights as a career attorney, during the Obama years, I noticed there was a settlement agreement with the Arcadia School District. Interesting, I wanna check this out. So I open up the agreement, and it's based on a sexual harassment theory covering gender identity, and that the school district was to treat students according to their stated gender identity in all respects, in all programs, and no real exceptions. Of course, there was no statutory basis for them to be doing such a thing, uh, especially back then. It was very aggressive to be pushing this theory of redefining Title IX's sex discrimination 
prohibitions. Well, the school district quickly complied, changed their programs, started uh, transgender support systems per the settlement agreement. And about a year ago, I ran into a woman named Abby Martinez. You should all know the story of Abby Martinez. She presented at the Heritage Foundation a few months ago, and her daughter was in the Arcadia School District. This was after the settlement agreement was put in place and they changed all their policies, and her daughter was going through some pretty severe depression uh, starting at middle school. She was picked on and, uh, you know, migrant daughter, and the hardships of growing up, it's tough. When she got to her Arcadia School District, somebody told her, you know what, your problems might come from the fact that you might be a boy. This was Yaley Martinez, Abby's daughter. And she got into the local LGBT support group, which was of course fully supported by the administration, and the administration had to bend over backwards to try to affirm the daughter over the wishes of Abby, her mother, who was supportive in her daughter, you know, cutting her hair short and dressing how she wanted, but she said, but, but you are a girl. You've always been a girly girl. Uh, I love you, but I'm not gonna put you on the track of cross-sex hormones and puberty blockers. And she held firm on that as a mother, loving her daughter going through her mental health struggles. But the school district was not supportive of her mother. And in fact, she ended up losing custody of her daughter because she would not go along with what everybody was saying down the line, from the school to the counselors to everyone saying, what you must do in order to be a good mom is to go along with the notion that your daughter is a boy. And she was literally told this by one of the LGBT groups. Either you're gonna have a live boy or a dead girl. It is your choice. Imagine as a mother being put in that situation. She resisted, she lost custody, and what the Obama administration or the Biden administration said was supposed to be the cure. What ends the suicidal ideation is what they call the affirmation model. You must do this at every step. Schools must be supportive. You're bigots and discriminatory if you're not. So much so that we're gonna take your child away from you. That's how important it is. That's what happened. They took her child away from her, broke the bond between the mother and daughter, and then at the age of around 19, Yeni Martinez walked in front of a train and took her life. I know those train tracks. I've been by those train tracks, because it was not that far away from my house. And it all began from DOJ policies imposing a transgender ideology through an abuse of Title IX that led to a mother losing her daughter and that daughter not being treated for the underlying depression and taking her own life. That's a story you don't hear from the Biden administration. That's a story that has to be told and repeated. So watch Abby Martinez's video and her testimony and the tears that came from this tragedy. Those are the stakes. That's where this country is moving. And it's being formalized through the Title IX regulation. That regulation of which it does many things that are bad for the country, one of the most per pernicious is to solidify this ideology that what was once called being a tomboy is actually you were born a boy in a girl's body and putting kids on the track of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and surgeries that sterilize and putting a little girl, a little boy in a position at 11 or 12 years old to say, Tommy, Susie, Juan, Yaley, are you okay with never having children ever? Are you okay with never having a normal sexual experience? If they tell them that, because that's the track that they're put on if they start with the affirmation model, the pronouns, the hormones, and then the surgical interventions. 
That's where it's going. So when they say it's irreversible, that is a lie. That is a lie. And when they say, if you don't do this, you're going to end up with a dead boy or a live girl, or vice versa, they are also lying. Because that's the only thing that would ever be sufficient to separate a mom from her child, is that level of emotional terrorism. They relied on a few studies on suicidal ideation, which this NPRM talks about. I recommend to you Jay Green from the Heritage Foundation who has debunked the studies on suicidal ideation. Besides, it's suicidal ideation, not suicide, completed suicide. It's a very different thing. Um, who has debunked the study, so Jay Green, and the medicine, so-called, is on such unfirm ground, it's really driven by ideology. And frankly, much of it is just common sense. When kids who are going through questions of confusion, growing up, not accepting their bodies, over 90% of it resolves naturally with zero interventions whatsoever. Zero interventions naturally resolves. These policies, however, are structured such that it will be sex discrimination if you do not affirm a person's stated gender identity, which could include anything. Now, the administration is saying this is consistent with the Bostock decision, which dealt with Title VII, which said that transgender status would be recognized as a protected class. One, it was based on transgender status, not gender identity. Second, it presumed that there was a biological basis to male and female. So how do you square that with what they're proposing now? A purely subjective gender identity-based rule. You can't square it. How do you square it with religious freedom protections? You cannot square it. Now there is a religious liberty exception for institutions that are brave enough to say that these are our policies on the embodiment of male and female, but what about a teacher who has a sincere religious conviction is unwilling to deny a person's biological reality. And being perfectly polite about it, just saying, I'm gonna address you by your first name instead. No, that is too much. You must affirm all the way. The rule dismisses as unfounded the concerns for privacy and safety of boys and girls. Unfounded. Tell that to the father whose daughter was raped in the girls' bathroom in Loudoun County by a boy who was actually wearing a skirt and wanted accommodations for gender fluidity. And that father was arrested for raising this issue publicly in Loudoun County. And that issue may have, in fact, turned the election in Virginia because Governor Yunkin said, this craziness has to stop. Parents have to be respected. And the truth can't be swept under the rug because it was in that case. Because of the gender identity politics, the fact of that rape occurring in those school grounds was swept under the rug when that superintendent was asked directly, has this happened in your school district? Flat out lied and denied it. Said no, hasn't happened. And then the facts came out. So this rule of its many defects includes a change in the standard for sexual harassment. Instead of being just severe and pervasive on an objective standard, include it as a subjective standard as well. So if somebody is personally offended, subjectively, by the fact that a person, say, uses, uh, avoids pronouns, if they're subjectively offended, well, that co could constitute a hostile environment. The goal is to make sure that there's no space for people who dissent from that prevailing ideology. No room for a contrary view, which of course goes against academic freedom at the collegiate level. Uh, overnight trips, dorm rooms, all these spaces that were considered safe spaces for women are all at risk. And Ken mentioned that we had worked during the Trump administration on sexual harassment and did some important work with USC and Michigan State. Larry Nasser, the so-called doctor that abused so many gymnasts. Well, I spoke with one of the mothers of the gymnasts when we were doing a resolution agreement with Michigan State and said, what could we have done to help prevent it? What policies could we put in place? And because of that consultation, we required Michigan State University 
to have chaperones in the room when you have these intimate examinations so that there's somebody else who's familiar with what doctors should or should not be doing. Because there were moms in the room when their daughters were being abused because this doctor was, was saying, no, no, this is standard. There were some moms in the room having a qualified chaperone there. And we made sure that that chaperone at the behest of the parents or the students would be of the sex of their choice. The sex of their choice. And what we meant was biological sex because we would not want to re-victimize those students if they have somebody in an intimate facility when they're just seeking health care and they're disrobing in a point of maximum vulnerability, having somebody that they know is male in the room when, with them against their will when it's not necessary for their medical care. So we included that in the settlement agreement. Will this administration now say that's unlawful, that they have to undo that settlement agreement because it could it uh, makes a biological distinction. That's what's next. And I'll mention one last point on sports. The administration tries to duck the issue. They say that this rule requires ref uh, respect of a person's stated gender identity based on what they say subjectively, and there could be no biological distinction if there's a de minimis harm, de minimis, based on a person's subjective views. Then they also say, but we're not addressing sports. We'll leave that for another day. An absolute dodge. What that leaves is the general rule. If you don't have a specific rule that limits a general one, the general rule applies. That's law 101. And the general rule is if it makes somebody uncomfortable subjectively and it's de minimis, you got to do what that student says, which means boys and girls sports at every level contact or non-contact. That's the only way I see of interpreting this rule. So don't believe the dodge. And if you didn't comment on that rule when it, when it closed, that was September 12th, comment on section 1557. That's the healthcare rule. That one closes October 3rd. So you got time. And they are re required to answer our petitions. And you know, Catherine Lehman didn't show up in person to answer, but she will have to answer if we submit our comments, so do it. And that's my final word of advice. Uh, it's not the best democracy has to offer, but that's what we got. And if you don't answer these tough questions that I'm raising, that Justin's raising and others, then they could lose in court. So file those comments. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. So I am sorry that we were not able to deliver Catherine Lehman. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I'm the next best since Catherine Lehman and I have been job switching uh, every four to eight years over the last uh, four administrations. I actually never talked to her uh, before um, until just a few weeks ago. And I raised this issue with her. I said, uh, not this issue, but I said, Catherine, you know, you and I have been trading jobs pretty much every four to eight years. You're the assistant secretary now, but before you know it, Things may change, and you will have to run the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law. <laughs> she didn't find that funny. No, no, I lied. She laughed in my face just like you just did. So, absent her, maybe I'll give you a little bit of a hard time if you'll let me. So let me start with you, Justin. So that was a great presentation, and we're thankful. But there are some things that you missed that those of us who are reading the Washington Post and the New York Times are aware of. We have read that uh, the Trump administration, under my evil self and Secretary DeVos and others, rolled back protections for victims, and that only now with the Biden regulations uh, will victims of sexual harassment and sexual assault receive uh, their due. Um, isn't that true, and shouldn't we support them uh, and the Biden administration's effort to give them uh, protections after all? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> No, and, and so, and, and look, here's, it, this sort of goes to, I think something Ken, you said in the intro, right? No one denies that, you know, bad things happen on college campuses. I don't believe that there is this crazy rape epidemic. I think that's all those statistics are a bunch of nonsense. If anybody actually believed the one in four statistic that if you sent your daughter to college, she has a 25% chance of being sexually assaulted, no one would go to college. Um, so I think that's silly. 
That said, look, I think our, our culture is in a, it, it, not in a great place. I think this sort of, this is not entirely for this panel, but I do think the sort of pornification of the culture has changed how young men think about things, right? And I think they can make bad decisions because they've been conditioned to do it, and you add alcohol to that, right? So I think it is a, it is a good thing that we have heightened awareness of this issue. And I just think anybody who went, who went to college, you know, more than... 10, 20 years ago would, should agree with that, I think. That it's, there's, there's a natural correction that needed to be done, but I think we wildly overcorrected the problem. And the way, of course, you know, we are all taught when we're kids, two wrongs don't make a right. And so just sort of steamrolling the rights of respondents, of, men, of young men, basically, to sort of to vindicate this you know, perceived need to, to, to correct a, a problem is not the right way to go about it. And the other thing is, look, I mean, this is, an, Ken, your, your question, you know, your incredibly tangentious question that I'm very offended by, um, is, is sort of an, it's an analog of like the start by believing thing, right? Shouldn't we just sort of start by believing people, right? And just like, uh, and that's, that's the attitude we should take. We shouldn't, you know, deal with this cross-examination stuff. Um, but, you know, we don't start by believing in America, right? We don't, that's what they, I think they do in like North Korea. Right, um, but here we, we start by listening. We might, if someone comes in and claims to have been sexually assaulted, we should listen. We should listen empathetically. Um, but then it's okay to ask questions because if you're going to accuse someone of, you know, I think indisputably one of the most horrifying things that you can accuse another human being of, you know, that person has the right, I think, to kind of take on your story. So, um, you know, I think. I will absolutely agree that, like, you know, the culture on college campuses, you know, isn't always great, and we need to have education, and we need to teach people how to treat each other. We need to teach people how to, you know, not drink too much alcohol, right, and, and, and sort of uh, and, and treat each other with respect. But I don't think what we have to do is sort of strip, uh, you know, a, a sort of a generation of young men of any sort of rights, um, you know, in the name of sort of achieving this level of justice. So does that answer your tendentious question? Sorry to offend you. <laughs> now I'll offend Roger. Um, and, and again, it was an honor to work with you on, on, on Title IX issues. So Roger, you made an interesting argument about Bostock. Uh, I think for some people, when we think that Bostock interpreted the term sex in Title VII uh, to apply to protect certain rights of uh, uh, gay, uh, lesbian, and also tra transgender persons, uh, the notion might be, well, the Biden administration is moving in the same direction uh, as Bostock, and you um, sketched out an argument that no, uh, they are actually contradicting it, despite the, perhaps, appearance. So my question is, is, uh, is this. Um, what does Bostock require in this area? Does it require uh, interpretation by the education department that Title IX applies to sexual orientation and transgender issues, but in a different way than the Biden administration suggests, or does it not? It, it doesn't require it. And it's, in fact, Gorsuch went out of his way to disclaim that this went beyond Title VII. So it was limited to hiring and firing in the Title VII context, not every Title VII context. There's things like uh, uh, dress codes and things like that that are still Title VII. He also said he's not addressing the religious freedom arguments, which are real and substantial, and the intimate facilities question. All of these things he said, we'll leave it for another day. Now, I think that the decision was terrible, unsupportable as a textualist matter, as an originalist matter as well. Uh, that decision has to be undone. It's, it's easy to see why the Biden administration wants to take that decision and apply it everywhere, right? There's a certain logic about it. That's why the logic was so flawed. But if you accept that logic, there is a logic about the decision that would want to metastasize to other areas. Now, would it be appropriate to apply it in the education context, in the healthcare context, et cetera? And I think there are meaningful distinctions in every single one. Uh, I talked about the sexual harassment case and intimate situations in medicine. Today, NIH says that every cell has a sex. Every cell in your body is either male or female. The Biden administration missed that. They have not scrubbed it yet. They have not found it yet. But once they do, if they watch this video, they're gonna probably try to take it down. <laughs> because sex as a biological variable matters, right? So I think it'd be, I think it'd be wrong to take 
the hiring and firing Title VII context and try to universalize that into every single context under the sun where sex comes to play. And given what Gorsuch said, that it's limited to this, then we have to litigate it at every step of the way. Um, and I think Gorsuch will come to rue and regret that decision because these, these issues are gonna come to him. And I think he's gonna say, that's not what I meant. This is different. Because he did say, he presumed sex is still binary and biological. Hmm. And all this gender identity, NPRMs, oh no, 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 it's nowhere near that. It's a, a complete spectrum. You could be asexual, that's not even on the spectrum. You could be, uh, and it's multiplying by the day. So I think he's gonna, he's gonna hopeful, rein it in once these cases come to him. Good. Um, Justin, let's return to the, the victims or perhaps survivors of uh, sexual um, assault and violence on, on campus. It may not be 25%, but it's not 0% either. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all agree that this is a serious, a serious issue. Um, now, as an attorney, not necessarily in Title IX issues, but I work all the time with um, reluctant uh, complainants. Uh, people who uh, come forward and say, I have suffered this or that uh, wrong, and I just don't want to come forward, um, either because I'm afraid of uh, retaliation or because it's just, it's just too much in one way or the other. Uh, they, they may feel intimidated by the college uh, bureaucracy or just by social, social pressures. There are some who argue that the uh, due process protections uh, in the current, which is to say Trump era, uh, regulations um, may intimidate some complainants from coming forward because they would be potentially cross-examined and subjected to other stressful situations. What is your reply? Good. Um, that's why I'm not confirmable. Um, so here's what I mean by that. Um, there is such a thing as a good chilling effect, and I think the the new regula the DeVos regulations have had a good chilling effect on chilling garbage complaints. Right, so you're, you, people, I, I just think, I, I've seen a big drop in the number of completely nonsensical complaints that I think anybody who, quest, who asks a few questions will be able to see right through. I don't think um, that it's going to chill you know, serious complaints, and if it does, I, I'm afraid that's just the sort of, you know, kind of the tax we pay to freedom, right? I mean, it, it, that's true in the criminal context too, right? Getting, you know, going through any sort of trial, I used to be a prosecutor and I did homicides in DC and violent crimes in DC. Putting, you know, you don't put homicide victims on the stand, but you put other violent crime victims on the stand and it's hard. Um, and it should be hard when you are trying to take someone's freedom away or here in the college context when you're trying to really take someone's future away. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have protections. I absolutely, you, know, you mentioned retaliation. There should be robust retaliation protections. Um, uh, you know, there, it's uh, inexcusable for anybody involved in a Title IX context to you know, try to intimidate the other person, try to intimidate their witnesses, um, and you know, but I think that's how you solve that problem. And the other way you solve it um, is just by support measures, right? By just th the school telling both sides, "Look, we'll he we're here for you. We can try to do other accommodations." But look, I am I I believe that there has you know, I, there's always a chilling effect when you don't just believe an accuser. Um, and, I, and I think that's, again, that's just like the, the, the bargain you make in a, in a free society. And I, I don't, I'm not gonna shy away from that. And it, if I could add to my previous response, <clears throat> Gorsuch said that in the hiring and firing context, transgender status, sexual orientation is irrelevant. He said that early on and then you could see where the decision was gonna go. So there are many instances where a person's actual embodiment is absolutely relevant. And that's a, gonna be a big distinction. Um, Roger, let me get sort of move beyond that on the on the transgender and LGBTQ issues. Um, you explained your views on Bostock, but let me ask you this: um, I think we can all agree that too many kids are bullied. All kinds of kids are bullied, harassed, beaten up, and those kids who are different uh, from others uh, tend to get it a little bit worse. Uh, I think we can also agree that uh, gay, lesbian, and transgender kids are often um, abused in, in various ways. Um, as you disagree with the Biden approach, what advice do you have either for schools or federal agencies in dealing with that sort of harassment and bullying of LGBTQ students or students at, at, at large? Yeah, and this, this goes beyond protected classes. People get bullied 
for all sorts of things that are not protected classes. Um, and then the question is, is there a federal role to be going down to the local level, to every little school district, and saying these are gonna be your bullying rules and your anti-bullying rules? I think not. I think it's dangerous if you have the federal government try to do that, because it's gonna get it wrong. It's gonna get it wrong and cause a lot of harm along the way. Bullying is a real problem, especially with the growth of social media. That's perhaps the worst type, and especially with young girls with body image issues. It's metastasizing, and it is vicious. It is vicious. Uh, there are some policy things that can be done with social media, with school districts limiting its use, because that is one of the key contributors to the bullying epidemic that's going on. And I will say that it also has to be even-handed in terms of all bullying should be stopped. We just saw perhaps differential treatment when there was a chant at a college campus that was alleged to be racial against a volleyball player. Uh, that story seems to be on very shaky ground. Yet just this weekend, you have on video the cheering section of Oregon saying blank the Mormons over and over again. Whereas in the first instance, it was everybody, was, who's gonna be fired, who's gonna be banned from the, from the stadium. They canceled games. Uh, what's, going, what's happening with Oregon when you have an on video saying blank the Mormons? It's just whole cheering sections, right? So if we're gonna talk about bullying, let's, let's be real about how it's happening. You wouldn't see blank the gays in a stadium like that. You would have heard about it if that had been going on, right? But you do have it with religious minorities, and where's the outrage there? And what would you like to do about uh, harassment of religious minorities in that context? Of religious minorities? Well, and you know very well what's happening with, with Jewish students in particular. So heard there's different it. levels in different contexts. Um, should there be a federal response to bullying? Generally, no. That's, it should be the states doing it because bullying goes beyond protected classes. I think some of the worst bullying is not directly impacted by protected classes. An overweight kid in school today or an overweight girl, wow, that's a tough place to be in in the Instagram era. Do we need the federal government coming in and say, okay, we're gonna do a new protected class of body size? No, I don't think we, we don't. Um, so we provide the resources where they're appropriate at the appropriate level. It's, um, and I think that's really where it should, would, should be addressed is mostly at the local level. Okay. I'm gonna push back just a little bit. So much bullying is not covered under federal anti-discrimination law, but some of it unquestionably is. There are federal anti-discrimination laws that address sex, race, national origin, for instance, disability uh, also, and numerous examples of kids being harassed and bullied on the basis of those classifications. That has legal ramifications under statutes passed by Congress, no matter how you interpret them. Let's take the LGBTQ example a little bit more. You've pointed out that Bostock has this language from Alito, which I think is subject to some debate, although you've given, I think, a clear interpretation. But even going back to something like Price Waterhouse, mm -hmm. under Title VII, but without Alito-like disclaimers, there we have the notion that uh, discrimination can include um, stereotypes based on sex. So even if overall women are uh, permitted to uh, ascend the corporate ladder, if it's only a certain kind of woman, that could be gender, gender stereotype. Um, what I have seen in looking at a lot of these claims by LGBTQ students is that many of them if they're not coached to talk, to talk about the LGBTQ issues, what they're saying is that they were beaten up because they were viewed as being either, the word used to be effeminate. They're, they're beaten up because they deviate from certain norms about what society thinks a boy or girl is. You don't have to label that as LGBTQ. That could be described simply as gender stereotypes. Is that something that you would view as being properly the province of a, of a Title IX type interpretation? And, and I think you meant Gorsuch, right? Alito wrote the I'm dissent. sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the, 
the sex stereotyping theory was not the one that prevailed at the Supreme Court. Most people thought that'd be where the action was gonna be. It, it wasn't though. He said, this is sexualist, sex means sex, there's a biological difference, and you're treating person differently based on their biological sex, because gender identity is inextricably linked to biology. That was the argument. It was not on stereotyping. Um, so that's still out there to be litigated how it's gonna shake out. The standard, I think, should be what was in the DeVos rule, right? Is it severe and pervasive such that it denies a person the educational opportunity? That's the standard legal framework for harassment, and that's what governs. Are you being denied the opportunity? And if bullying is such that it has, the, has that effect, severe or pervasive denial, and the administrations of the schools are turning a blind eye, recklessly indifferent, et cetera, then it could be a violation of law if it falls under a protected class. Again, some of the worst bullying in history happens to kids that are overweight, and that's not covered under federal law. As horrendous as that is, it's, that's not what the law says. And we have to be faithful to the text of the law. Um, so if we go down the sex stereotyping route to cover gender identity and sexual orientation, you go all the way. There is no half measure. You go straight into the pronouns, you go straight into these facilities, because um, all of it is based on uh, ultimately saying that sex doesn't matter, that it's all made up and any manifestation is not related to biology, that's not where we wanna go because I don't think that's what the law provides. If Congress wanted to say that, it could. It has said that in a couple instances in statute and it's free to do so if it wants to. While I ask the next question of Justin, I'll say there will be time if you have a question uh, or two also and we still have a microphone or two that's available. Justin, let me ask you a money question. Um, when I looked at the comments on the uh, Title IX regulations during the last administrations, we certainly got a whole lot from uh, women's groups, survivors, advocates, so on and so forth. But we also got um, quite a few from colleges and universities. And one of the arguments that they made, and this was especially true of smaller colleges, and you're aware that many colleges have gone out of business over the last several years, and many of them are struggling. And college presidents would write in to say that they were concerned about due process models that would drive up costs for them. They were concerned about uh, departing from the single investigator model um, in ways that could require them to hire outside um, experts. That the cost of hiring outside adjudicators, for instance, uh, could be crippling. Um, and they spoke in some ways of language that may not be entirely foreign to some in this audience about a concern of federal regulations driving up costs um, and uh, burdening uh, private as well as public universities. What do you make of that? Well, I, I guess it's a couple things. Um, one, uh, as a previous panel discussed, sometimes colleges uh, spend money on stupid things. So before I actually decided whether I would care about what a particular college said the cost would be, I would want to see, you know, does it have a climbing wall, a lazy river? Uh, did it just, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. And I'm serious about that, right? I mean, I think it's more important to pay for, you know, thing, pro due process that sort of can fundamentally affect people's lives than it is to pay for a climbing wall. Um, so I, I would want to, you know, I, I wouldn't take those comments at face value, number one. Number two, generally you should not believe what a hostage says when a gun is at their head. Um, and, you know, no university president who values their job and doesn't work for about, like, I don't know, six colleges in the country is going to say, no, we actually thank you for giving respondents more rights. We, we've been really hoping you would do that, right? So I'm going to discount it there, too. But let's just say you get past one and two and it's you know, meant in good faith. I don't think it has to be a heavy lift. I mean, the schools, I think, make it sort of overblown, like you have to hire you know, retired judges and you know, set up trials. It's just not that hard to do. I mean, you know, people, we've been uh, trying people for a lot worse things, um, you know, with a lot less money for a long, long time in a lot of places. So to me, I, you know, I, to me that, that concern was always a bit overblown. Um, and gee, somehow they all managed to do it. Um, so yeah, that's my answer to that. 
So I'm going to ask what I think is my last question, first of Roger and then of, of you. Roger gave some helpful advice on what people can do if they're concerned about this issue, including on commenting on non-education department uh, regulations. Uh, we have a mix of people here. We have uh, some litigators in the room. We have uh, think tank and public policy people. We have activists. We have some academics, lots of different sorts of uh, people. Uh, for those who are specifically concerned about the Biden regulation, given that the comment phase is over, is there anything else, uh, Roger, that you would suggest? <clears throat> well, the Section 1557 regulation is based on Title IX by statute. The statute says health care discrimination is outlawed on the basis provided by Title VI, et cetera, and Title IX, and the enforcement mechanisms apply. So it is a Title IX regulation that will be applied in the healthcare context. So if you missed your chance the first time, you didn't miss it this time. It's still a Title IX related regulation. Second thing is with parents, right? That's how I started. Get parents activated and involved because the question of you know, bullying and the, the pressure schools are putting on kids, they're bullying the parents and they're labeling the parents the bullies. Let's not forget that. That's where this ends up going, that the government says this is how your child should be raised, and if you as a parent are against it, you're the bully, you're the problem, and you don't want the schools to be at war with parents, but that's where we're headed. So activate parents, go to school board meetings, get involved, and I think that's going to be another very important way of pushing back, because these policies, oh, and also prepare, think about the schools you're sending your kids. Ask the question, if your daughter is assigned a dorm mate, is there any guarantee it's not going to be a biological male? Can the university put that in writing? That's important, because as parents, that's where we're going to be sending our sons and daughters. So ask those hard questions and get involved. Thank you. Justin? Uh, you know, I would quote, the song Rumors by Timex Social Club from 1987. I think I'll write my congressman and tell him to pass a bill. Um, uh, so, you know, I think you can look, kind of look for state law measures to do this. I don't, you know, I, I think frankly, the, if the administration changes, the regs are going to go back. I think that, you know, this is going to be a full employment act for school lawyers for a long, long time. Um, so, you know, if this is an issue, you vote on the presidential, you vote on that. Um, but otherwise, like, I think I would look at the state level, like try, you know, if you can get state uh, laws passed um, that sort of to guarantee due process. I mean, California has this fabulous law called the Leonard Law um, that any school um, that takes any sort of state funding, um, which I think they all do, um, has to give full First Amendment rights to every student on its campus. And that applies even to private schools. Now, isn't that fabulous? Um, so can you copy that in sort of, you know, in the due process context or something like that? Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that's what I would say. Thank you. Looks like we have a question. Hi, so uh, my name is Christine Pratt. I've worked on these issues in the Trump administration. Um, and my question for the panelists is, when we talk about these issues, when we talk about the problems that this new iteration of Title IX presents, um, it's, it's the question that kind of comes to my mind is that we're, we're stuck in this defensive stance where we say, kids, you know, these, these poor kids over here shouldn't have access or shouldn't, they, they aren't a protected class. And for a lot of, you know, sort of everyday Americans who maybe want to think of themselves as, you know, uh, compassionate and, you know, we're, we, we want to, to protect more people or we want life to be better for more kids. What is, how would you articulate ideologically what you stand for? What, what, what do the, the Betsy DeVos Title IX statutes, what, what good does that give to America? Well, it, it sets the, the floor. I think most federal civil rights statutes were passed, I guess every single one, in response to a national problem that was not being solved locally and not being solved by the free market. So you had market failure, sometimes governments themselves were the bad actors. That's, I mean, I was a civil rights lawyer for many years now, and they've been motivated and passed for the 
noblest of reasons and have helped knit a more perfect union. So, but it sets the floor, right, for the most egregious, because there's always a downside. There's always a downside to the exertion of federal power, because the fit is, is never gonna be quite right, because the federal laws are blunt instruments. So you use a blunt instrument to take on blunt problems. It's not a scalpel. You're gonna get it wrong sometimes. You're gonna ruin a young man's career based on a false story, right? That's, those are downsides that have to be balanced. And not every wrong could be righted. Uh, that's a reality of a messy world. But the worst ones should, can and should be addressed. And we gotta be careful with some where it actually exacerbates problems and creates new ones. Again, a lot of people were pushing uh, on Yeli, Yeli Martinez and thought it was a good thing to separate her from her mom and look at the tragic consequences that it ended up as a result. And it started from federal intervention in that school district. Alice, oh, I'm sorry, did you want no, to? No, no, it's fine. Is there, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, go ahead. Hi, Ken. Hi, good, good, good to see you. Good to see you. I have two questions. One is with respect to athletics. The department has announced that it's going to go through a separate rulemaking with respect to athletics, but it seems to me that once you change the definition of sex to include gender identity and sexual orientation and other pregnancy-related conditions, then you have necessarily, you don't need a separate rulemaking based on athletics. And my second question is with respect to the pregnancy-related conditions portions of the proposed regulations. Because it's pregnancy-related conditions, do you think this is really kind of an attempt to potentially create a federal civil right to abortion through Title IX? Yeah. <clears throat> On the first one, you're absolutely right. Their dodge is absolutely ineffective. Um, when they're redefining the standard of what sex is and decoupling it from biology explicitly, which is what they're doing, there's no two way around it. No, way, no way around it. They, the biological distinction is now gone, and if it causes a de minimis harm to somebody, you gotta comply with what subjectively they want. Maybe they'll try to put some limits in subsequent rulemaking, I don't know. But they've unleashed chaos if this rule gets finalized as is. Uh, on the second point, termination of pregnancy is included. It was listed 39 times in the reg, gender identity 112 times in the preamble. So yeah, it's there, and they don't mention the word abortion, but we all know how this administration, especially after Dobbs, is interpreting every federal statute to try to create a federal right to abortion. So unless they specifically finalize a rule, saying abortion is not covered, then beware, because they're gonna, they're gonna interpret it probably in guidance afterwards to cover abortion, especially after Dobbs. Thank you, Roger and Farnaz. At this point, I think we should be able to have just enough time for the two people who are standing. Um, Allison. Hi, uh, Allison Selman, Pacific Legal Foundation. Obviously, there's a fairly wide gulf between the views of the median person in this room, perhaps in the panel, and those people who are proposing to implement the new Title IX rule. That said, are there any realistic changes that could be made to the draft of the proposed rule that could head off what, in our view, are some of the worst harms? Are there any sort of realistic changes they might be inclined to make that could make this rule better, even given the broad ideological differences? Yeah, I mean, I, I think on the, uh, are there? Sure. Will there be? No. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think one thing, for example, the new rule um, would propose, would basically allow for the elimination of live hearings um, and say that, you know, schools can now pick between live hearings and the single investigator model, which is a huge Les Mis fan I always refer to as the Javert model. Um, so I think you could, you know, maybe eliminate that and say, look, we're going to like make sure everybody gets a hearing. Um, I don't think this administration will ever uphold cross-examination. Um, you know, I think one thing they're, they're proposing to do um, is re revoke your right to see all of the evidence against you. I'll, I'll say that again. They, they're proposing to revoke your right to see all the evidence against you. Um, no, I'm, I'm not making that up. Um, the DeVos regulations allow you to see all the evidence, um, and the new regulations um, say that they have to, quote, provide either equitable access to the relevant and not otherwise impermissible evidence 
or to the same written investigative report that accurately summarizes the evidence. So you get like a Cliff's Notes of what those bad text messages say, but we're not gonna give you the texts, right? So I'd like to think that there could be a middle ground there where you know, uh, you know, sort of progressive Democrats who really, I swear to God, once believed in due process, mm -hmm. realize, well, I hide in evidence is maybe, maybe shouldn't be the new thing we're, we're, we're gonna go down with the ship on. So, I, you know, I, I'd like to believe that, but, you know, I'm jaded. <clears throat> Abortion neutrality is in the Title IX statute. Separate living facilities is in the statute based on sex. If they were gonna limit the harm, at least take into account biological realities and the statutory tax on abortion, are they gonna do it? I doubt it. And religious freedom as well. Take, you know, RIFRA's there as a super statute. Uh, that's what Gorsuch said it was, and give it its proper respect in the rulemaking. That would help a bit. Don't hold your breath. We have just a couple more minutes for our last question. Right, Jeff Hunt, Colorado Christian University. So. Christian colleges like ours are facing this on the ground right now in realities, uh, especially on Title IX transgenderism. You got that concern, you got safety of your female athletes concerns going on right now. What's your recommendation to Christian colleges that are dealing with this right now? I mean, the mm -hmm. kind of practice right now is to forfeit if you face that situation. Um, but what are the legal consequences of all of this? What are your recommendations to us? Put your, po put your policies in writing and live by them. It is use it or lose it time. And don't think that if you just keep your head down and keep your beliefs quiet, it somehow will blow over. They're gonna come for you, they will eventually find you too. And if you don't have those written policies, they're gonna say you're making stuff up for litigation purposes, it was never sincere to begin with. Don't be in that position. Get your policies written, live by your beliefs, and uh, hopefully they won't have this shameless that they had under the Biden administration bring that back. But sometimes if you have to pre-declare that these are your beliefs to the Department of Education, you might have to do that and, and bear the consequences, but it is worth it. Because if you don't do it, you're gonna lose that, that right. Let me ask, and just as a practical tip, Roger, would you advise someone who's at a, like a Christian college like that, not only to put the policy in there, but to say like, it is our sincerely held religious belief based on the following reasons that we have this policy. Would that help insulate it a little bit if you framed it that way in writing from the outset? I am not giving direct legal advice to a particular person. <laughs> Speaking as a conference lawyer. Because <laughs> I am a lawyer, so I have to keep my bar license intact. Um, there are many things you could do in particular cases. Uh, Eric Niffen is fantastic. He's a national expert on that. Give him a call for, for specific questions, but live it. And if that means forfeiting games, because that's your belief, then that, that proves the sincerity beyond question. And that it sends a very important message. The Coach Kennedy case, he was willing to be fired and I got to the Supreme Court because of his witness and his bravery. So let's follow that example. Thanks again to the Federalist Society, Defense of Freedom Institute, our distinguished panels, and all of you. We should have time for a quick break, and then the main event is coming.